could ask everyone to please find their seats, turn their phones on to silent mode, um, have the privilege to welcome uh, everyone here today, really excited about uh, our event with the Office of the National Cyber Director and its director, Harry Coker, and then a, a great panel of the inner agency to talk about the ni National Cybersecurity Implementation Plan. Um, as I think many of you know, uh, about a last July, a year ago, the National Cy Cybersecurity Strategy came out. Uh, on the heels of that, they did a quick implementation plan, and now they have uh, the time and space to, to, to try to put a little bit of uh, science behind the art of some of those issues. So really excited to uh, have Harry Coker join us today. Uh, Harry was confirmed just before Christmas, so an early Christmas present, um, and is uh, even though he recently had knee sur surgery, that hasn't stopped him. He hit the ground running from day one. He's been uh, doing uh, some amazing work, and we have an opportunity today to discuss the implementation plan as well as the cyber posture report, which I hope we can touch on a little bit. The posture report basically evaluates and assesses our cyber readiness, and it brings a little bit of science to the art of cybersecurity policy making. So prior to um, being uh, nominated and, and serving as our national cyber director, Harry has been a public servant his entire career. Started in uh, Navy, Navy, uh, Naval Academy grad, uh, 20 years in uniform, took off that uniform, but didn't stop serving the American people. He went to the Central Intelligence Agency for a number of years when he and I first uh, met one another. Uh, he had various roles there that uh, set him up perfectly for the national cyber role. He was uh, running the open source center at the Central Intelligence Agency. He was part of the whole digital innovation team and 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 lots of alphabet soup acronyms within all of that. And uh, and this is not an oxymoron. He was also public affairs at CIA. They do actually have a public affairs shop, and, and Harry did a fantastic job in that role. He went from CIA to the National Security Agency, where he was the executive director. Uh, he served under one of Auburn's greatest, Admiral Mike Rogers, and then uh, under General Nakasone. And uh, fair to say, uh, not only because he's a Navy officer, but he is an officer, he is a gentleman, He's been a public servant his entire life, and I think that set him up perfectly for this current role. Um, Harry, thank you for joining us today. And, and he'll start with uh, some, some 15, 20 rem minute remarks. We'll go into a fireside chat, and then we, I will introduce uh, uh, Catherine Gromberg, one of our senior fellows, who will introduce the, the panelists from the interagency. Harry, please join me in welcoming Harry Coker. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. Uh, not just the warm introduction, but uh, um, your mentorship over the years. It means a lot. Um, and thank you all, uh, as well as to the McCrary Institute, for hosting today's event. Uh, I really am delighted uh, to be here to discuss several important topics to include the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan Version 2, as well as the importance of federal coherence. Uh, as our posture report says, we are are in the midst of fundamental trans uh, transformation in our nation's cybersecurity today. <laughs> uh, our cyberspace uh, is growing in complexity. It's more interconnected than ever before, and it's increasingly uh, defined by competition. The threats we face remain daunting, uh, and our defenses are not impregnable. Uh, aspiring just to manage the worst effects of cyber incidents uh, is insufficient. Uh, our work must continue to evolve to meet the changing and challenging landscape. And yet, we have made progress in realizing the affirmative vision for a safe, prosperous, and equitable digital future, a vision that is laid out in President Biden's National Cybersecurity Strategy. And that's the vision that guides the work of the Office of the National Cyber Director. Just two weeks ago, uh, while many of us were at RSA in San Francisco, uh, the Office of the National Cyber Director, ONCD, uh, delivered a first-of-its-kind uh, report to the President, to the National Security 
advisor, and to our partners, uh, Congress. Uh, the 2024 report on cybersecurity posture of the United States provided our view on the state of cybersecurity in our great nation. It's, and, and I, I can say unequivocally that the United States national cybersecurity posture has improved and will continue to do so. However, it's clear that a, a reactive posture cannot keep pace with fast evolving cyber threats and a dynamic technology landscape. It's also clear that just managing the worst effects of cyber incidents is no longer sufficient to ensure our national security, our economic prosperity, and our democratic values. In the posture report, we examine the evolving risk to critical infrastructure, the persistence of cyber crime to include ransomware, the increasingly complex supply chain environment, growth of commercial spyware, and the power of artificial intelligence. And in light of these trends, a coherent program of action led by the federal government and aligned with our private sector and allied partners is required. Uh, much of the work was captured in the first round of the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan. As many of you know, we just published version two in July uh, of, of last year, excuse me, version one. Uh, but here are the quick stats from Implementation Plan version one. The federal government was responsible for 36 initiatives led by 14 different agencies. Uh, by the second quarter of 2024, 33 of those initiatives were completed. Uh, for those of you doing the math, it's better than any grade I ever got. It's not 92 percent. 33 additional items are due over the next two years, and they're all on track to be completed, not just on time, but on mission. And thanks to the new version of the National Cybersecurity strategy implementation plan uh, that we'll discuss today. Uh, there are 31 new initiatives led by six additional uh, federal agencies. And all of this work, and frankly, all of our progress is due to one key element, partnership. At ONCD, uh, we are the center of federal cohesion for the cybersecurity ecosystem. We're tasked with bringing collaboration and coordination to all levels that's commensurate with our nation's security and the challenges that we face. And today, I, I'm feeling bold enough to say that the level of coherence that ONCD and our mission partners uh, have demonstrated is enhancing our national security. ONCD brings value to the cybersecurity ecosystem by bringing our partners together, developing strategies, and driving action. But our progress depends on the willingness, capabilities, and passion of our partners. Our important collaborators include our federal uh, partners and friends across the entire federal ecosystem. It includes our interna international partners, our state, local, tribal, and territorial uh, partners, those from industry, academia, and civil society to include nonprofits, and many more that enhance our collective resilience to cyber threats. Congress has also been a vital partner in the implementation process, and we will continue to engage with our partners on the Hill to ensure that departments and agencies have the resources and the authorities that they need. But with no shortage of challenges on the horizon, uh, the administration and Congress must continue to work together in a nonpartisan manner to advance U.S. cybersecurity and resilience. In fact, implementing our strategy requires more than a collaborative whole nation effort. As I stated earlier, uh, the, the need to partner with our international allies is a reality, so it really is a whole of nations effort that's required. So with our thanks again to McCrary Institute for bringing us together today, let me highlight just a few of the key elements of our new implementation plan. Critical infrastructure, that's one of the things that we're most proud of in the new implementation plan and it's the new federal agencies that we brought to the table. Again, six different agencies are leading initiatives for the first time. Four of them are sector risk management agencies. And I wanna take a minute just to unpack what that says about our approach to partnership and how it embodies federal coherence. First, it's important to acknowledge that the administration has been very busy on critical infrastructure security policy over the last few months. Uh, the week before we, we released our latest implementation plan, 
Uh, the President actually signed National Security Memorandum 22 on critical infrastructure security and resilience. And NSM 22 came on the heels of the President releasing uh, his budget for FY25. These documents all reflect a coherent approach to our efforts to build cyber resilience into our nation's critical infrastructure. They complement and build off of each other, reflecting policy, resourcing, and action that, when taken together, are multiplicative, not additive. And to understand the through line, let's first take a look at the National Security Memorandum. Uh, the process to update our critical infrastructure policy kicked off, actually, uh, in response to congressional action, the codification of the Sector Risk Management Agency roles and responsibilities in the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. Based on the input and impetus from our partners in Congress, the Biden-Harris administration fleshed out what these responsibilities really mean and what they need to mean. We clarified that the SRMAs, in partnership with CISA and other relevant agencies, including regulators, must develop plans to mitigate risk that are grounded in core security requirements. These plans must make use of every tool and authority available, from cyber insurance to regulation to grants, like those being made under the bipartisan infrastructure law. The NSM also requires the Director of National Intelligence to provide targeted support to the sector risk management agencies to help them and their sectors better understand the threat landscape. And it empowers CISA, the National Coordinator for Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience, to support its fellow SRMAs by providing capabilities and resources, such as cybersecurity expertise, risk assessments, and other essential services. Each of these policy changes builds on the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Version 1. The National Cybersecurity Strategy stated that the government would pursue regulatory approaches for critical infrastructure where appropriate, and the first IP has initiatives focused on mapping authorities and regulatory harmonization. The strategy also calls for increased intelligence sharing with the private sector, and the implementation plan contains an initiative that's nearly complete uh, for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to review existing classification policies. Version one of the plan also called on CISA to create an office to support the SRMAs in need. Those functions will be part of CISA's new Office of the National Coordinator. All these documents are synergistic. From the bill, to the strategy, to the implementation plan, to the National Security Mem Memorandum, and to version two of the IP, each is building on and reinforcing the work of the past. This is what coherence looks like, and it extends to resourcing as well. Last June, as part of the first implementation plan, the Office of Management and Budget and ONCD jointly released cybersecurity budgetary guidance for agencies for fiscal year 2025. We highlighted the roles of the SRMAs and the need for agencies to appropriately fun fund those functions. The President's budget proposal reflects exactly those prior priorities. The Department of Health and Human Services requested a $12 million increase for the cybersecurity capacity of the administration for strategic preparedness and response. EPA requested $25 million in additional SRMA capacity, as well as $25 million for its first ever dedicated cyber grant for water utilities. The, Dep the U.S. Department of Agriculture doubled its SRMA funding request. These appropriations will be vital to continue implementation of the strategy and of National Security Memorandum 22. And we are looking to our partners in Congress to having kicked off conversations on SRMA responsibilities to fund them. This is what coherence looks like. Now, of course, we have our new implementation plan, and it contains initiatives from these agencies as they continue to mature. For example, in the healthcare and public health sector, HHS will implement their cybersecurity strategy, develop baseline standards for hospitals, and work with Congress to deliver aid to small, rural, and critical access care facilities. In the water and water, wastewater system sector, the EPA will bring more technical assistance to the public water systems that not only keep our taps flowing, but also provide critical coolant for everything from power plants to data centers. 
and the support of the water sector, USDA will invest in its Rural Water Circuit Rider Program to fully integrate cybersecurity offerings for vulnerable utilities. These efforts complement the ongoing sector risk management planning under NSM 22. And I would fully expect to see discrete cyber tasks from the sector plans in future iterations of the National Cybersecurity Implementation Plan. This is what coherence looks like. Now, getting all of us together, moving in the same direction, it's not always easy, but it is amazing what we can, can accomplish when we do that. Now I'd like to focus on another theme you'll see in version two of the implementation plan. As I mentioned before, one of President Biden's first major cybersecurity actions was signing Executive Order 14028. And while largely focused on ensuring the federal government will lead by example in cybersecurity by getting its own house in order, the executive order also created the Cyber Safety Review Board, or CSRB. This innovated innovative public-private partnership brings together ex experts from the government and industry to review cyber incidents, conduct root cause analysis, and then provide recommendations on how to prevent or reduce the impact of future cyber intrusions. The National Cybersecurity Strategy doubles down on the value of the CSRB, calling for its codification by Congress. In the first version of the implementation plan, ONCD also had an initiative to ensure that significant recommendations from the CSRB were actually put into practice. And let me highlight two examples of what that looks like. The CSRB's lapses report focused on a loosely organized threat actor group that for several months in late 2021 and early 2022, conducted a series of high profile hacks of everything from government agencies to chip makers. One of the more sinister findings from the lapses report was the criminals' use of juveniles to aid their schemes. Many of the core lapsus members were themselves under the age of 18, and the CSRB found that criminal gangs exploit adolescents' legal status in the criminal justice system, redirecting repercussions that could be imposed on adult threat actors operating in the background. Frankly, this is terrifying. It's terrifying to think that our children are being recruited to commit crimes. It shows a clear gap in our policy and a horrific opportunity for our adversaries. We need to go after the real criminals and we need to remove the incentives for them to actively recruit our youth. Thankfully, in the second version of the National Cybersecurity Implementation Plan, and thanks to the recommendation of the CSRB, the Department of Justice will develop a whole of society approach to improve prevention, deterrence, and redirection of juvenile cyber offenders. We need to give kids a path to move away from these criminals, and I look forward to seeing DOJ's progress as they act on that recommendation. Beyond lapses, the CSRB also examined the exploitation of the popular log for shell open source software project. At ONCD, we chair the government's open source software security initiative, so this report had special resonance with us. We know that open, soft, open source software is foundational to nearly every technology we use in government, critical infrastructure, or our homes. We also know we need to continue to incentivize activities to shore up secure development of open source to prevent a tragedy of commons. As part of CSRB's review, the board noted that there was not, was not a centralized inventory of open source software used by the federal government. There is no easy way for the government to understand the code that supports its critical mission delivery and to make commensurate investments in secure development. The CSRB, hence, recommended exploring the creation of an open source software security risk assessment center to house this inventory and to develop metrics for and advocate for best practices in software security across the government. Through the implementation plan, CISA, with support from NIST, is assessing the feasibility of such a center and taking the steps necessary in the involving risk management in light of the most significant cyber event of the past several years. Now, integrating lessons learned into our approach is core to the success of the National Cybersecurity Strategy. The CSRB helps us identify gaps. The implementation plan helps us close them. And both are ongoing processes that will drive continuous improvement in our nation's cybersecurity posture. 
And as with many projects that are partnership driven, our path must be clear. And thanks to the second version of our implementation plan, we have collectively renewed our commitment to building a defensible, resilient, and values aligned digital ecosystem. To our federal government partners that are part of today's program and our vital work ahead, we thank you. And Frank, we thank you and McCrary uh, for hosting us, and I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Harry, for a, a tour de force on, on two major initiatives in thinking about the digital path of these initiatives. You know, when I look at the posture report in particular, I think it's bringing a lot of that thinking that the national security community understands and appreciates, but we haven't necessarily seen that through some of the broader civilian agencies. So I'd, I'd be curious what your thinking is. Uh, what surprised you? Uh, I, I mean, firstly, maybe in the role as, uh, as the National Cyber Director, but also what we learned from version one into version two, and, and, and any, any sort of curveballs that you weren't ready for? Um, and, and if you can maybe grab the mic, that'd be great. Because And I forgot to welcome all our viewers uh, online, so thank you. And a lot of state, local, tribal, territorial, and War Eagle, so. Oh, oh great, great. <laughs> um, the surprises. I was um, not so much surprised as I was pleased in that uh, the office brought together um, a, a partnership that was broad and deep uh, from the, the federal government to the state, local, tribal, and territorial, and many of our, our private sector partners to, uh, to pull together a, a strategy. And the benefit uh, of having uh, such a broad and diverse set of inputs was number one, the product itself was made stronger, more thoughtful. Um, the, the differing perspective helped us to build a, a better strategy. But also, it gave uh, our mission partners uh, a rightful sense of ownership. It's not ONCD's strategy. It's our, it's our nation's strategy, and our partners uh, participated, I think, in nearly 400 sessions uh, wow. to provide input, and, and the office demonstrated that it wasn't just uh, there to allow someone to talk. It was a dialogue, and there were um, upgrades made based on that input that we had from our mission partners. So I was, I was pleasantly surprised um, at how uh, that strategy, again, it was, is our nation's document and more than just the name. And you know, the old adage, what gets measured gets done, but it also allows us to reflect and make sure we're measuring what matters, yes. right? Yes. I, I mean, if yeah. the goal lines are constantly moving, yeah. we're never going to, and I'm not saying we'll ever declare a victory yeah. in yeah. the cyber domain, but yeah. from a risk-based perspective, uh, um, what gets measured gets done, and, and, and this is going to be an annual process. It correct? is, and a couple of things on that front. Um, the implementation plan is, is the first uh, transparent, a publicly released implementation plan uh, with that high level accountability. Um, as, a, um, as a former program manager, thank you Dave, um, <laughs> I, I appreciate uh, the importance of having you know, the equivalent of, of cost schedule performance, these metrics that uh, we have to deliver on. So again, it's uh, you know, more than 10 uh, federal agencies and departments that, that signed up to lead the implementation of, uh, of, of various uh, milestones. So they said, we will deliver. Uh, they also agreed to what was actually going to be del delivered. It's not just, uh, I'll deliver what I want, it's what the team <laughs> wants. And on schedule, again, that 92% that rate, uh, gosh, I would love to have had that. But we, we have that transparency, that accountability, um, and that, that does drive us, and that's a good thing. You know, it, it puts you sometimes in an unenviable position because yep. we don't want to grade on a curve. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do have to call out the laggards, yes, right? Yes, indeed. And how do you see that playing out in the future? Because, I mean, what I think is beautiful about the, uh, uh, about the implementation report and the posture report combined, it actually provides benchmarks and goals yep. and... and, and and it actually can allow our oversight entities, whether in Congress or OMB, 
policy without resources is rhetoric. It allows right, us right. to throw some money in a smart way. It, it, it does, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you knitted all of those together. Uh, the, the strategy. Um, they do come together, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> no, um, the, the, the strategy is um, is more enduring, mm -hmm. although it, it, it will change eventually. But it's uh, it's more enduring. It's threat and technology agnostic. It tells us what we need to do, and you can plug in any technology, any threat, and if we follow the guidelines of the National Cybersecurity Strategy, we'll be on on track. Uh, so that's a, more of an enduring document. The National Cybersecurity Implementation Plans are annual documents mm -hmm. um, because that allows us to evolve, hopefully, at a faster pace than the threat. We want to be uh, ahead of the threat, and that's what the implementation plans endeavor to do, again, in partnership uh, with, with our colleagues across uh, federal departments and agencies. Uh, we're now, as, as we talked about, on the, the second iteration of that implementation plan. Uh, and then the, the third document is the, the posture report. Um, it's great to have the strategy. Uh, it's greater to have the implementation plan. Mm -hmm. And it's greater to have feedback uh, to tell us, you know, from my perspective, um, I like to look at where we're not meeting our goals as opposed to um, patting ourselves on the back for what we've got accomplished. I think uh, bigger gains are there when we know where we're falling short. And so the posture report uh, addresses uh, the trends that our nation and frankly the world is, is faced with, and, and that's a good thing. So the strategy, the implementation plan, and the posture report, what we ought to be doing, how we have to do it, and when we need to have it done, and then the grade, if you will. Absolutely, and 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 not to to uh, anyone who has not read the posture report. It is the best unclassified threat uh, in in yep. a quick way. It covered mm -hmm. the threat in a in an unclassified way. I think exceedingly well. And yes. none of this matters because the bad guys got to, unless we look at it through the lens of our adversaries. So anything you want to? Yes. Yes. And, and that's, that's one of the key uh, points of that posture report, um, laying out the threat environment. Uh, you know, number one, our critical infrastructure is under increasing risk, and it will continue to be under increased risk. Hence the uh, emphasis on SRMAs and support to state, local, tribal, and territorial entities. Uh, number two, uh, the um, supply chain. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep an eye on that. We've seen in the past where our adversaries have, have leveraged uh, supply chain vulnerabilities to our detriment. Uh, we need to raise the awareness on that. Uh, thirdly, the increased availability of um, commercial spyware uh, is a challenge that, again, is going to take uh, not just public-private partnership, but um, international allies to work on this, this challenge of uh, commercial spyware. Uh, fourth, the, uh, the, the, the increasing uh, trend of cybercrime uh, to include ransomware that impacts, that can impact all of us. Uh, and, and then the, the fifth of those trends in this, this threat landscape um, is, is artificial intelligence. And I don't know that uh, there's ever been a um, revolutionary technology such as AI that's been in the hands of the general public. Uh, that's, that's a challenge area for us, um, and it's a challenge in, in one part because there are benefits uh, to AI. Uh, we, we need not um, sit in the corner and cry uh, about AI. We, we need to recognize the opportunities are, that are there as well uh, from a cybersecurity perspective in this case, um, and, 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 and leverage our values to input guidelines to AI, and that is going to require partnership with uh, the private sector and other nations as well. So, you know, you know, I, I recently hosted Phil Benables for a session on our uh, Cyber Focus. Uh, that's my infomercial for the mm -hmm. day, but uh, our podcast, video cast, and he actually was all in in making the case that AI will benefit the defender much more so than the, the blue side of the house than the red. And when we look at cyber, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say the initiative remains with the attackers. 
we're never going to stop everything everywhere all the time from every perpetrator yep. and every modality yep. of attack. Uh, when you look at some of the Volt Typhoon type uh, scenarios, yep. we should assume that some of our adversaries are prepositioned yes. uh, in some of our critical infrastructures. But resilience, we can, yep. right? And there was a big emphasis on the resilience side. Yeah, yeah, and a couple of points there. Um, I, I agree with you that we're not going to stop every attack every time. Hence resilience uh, we, we have to not be a free society ready for that. yep yep agree and so while we um, are constantly on the defense uh, we also need to be resilient because again in the national cybersecurity strategy we have an affirmative vision uh, for the digital foundation and we cannot will not allow our adversary to dictate the terms on which we leverage um, the digital foundation uh, oftentimes uh, we talk when we talk about cybersecurity, we put it purely in the lens of uh, traditional national security. But the digital foundation uh, is directly um, a player in our economic prosperity as a nation. Uh, so we uh, need to be on the offense in ensuring that that digital foundation is available to strengthen our economic prosperity. You, you also mentioned um, uh, awareness. And, when I talk about those uh, the, the, the threats and Volt Typhoon, uh, I was delighted at the end of January when uh, then uh, Representative Mike Gallagher uh, in, invited uh, myself, FBI Director We're going to miss Ray. him. Yeah, We're indeed, miss Mike. indeed, um, we are. But but we we've we'll got still have him involved. Forward. Yeah, yeah, we will. But um, the former congressman invited FBI Director myself, uh, Assistant Director Easterly. And, and then Director NSA Commander, U.S. Cyber Command Nakasone to testify in front of this House subcommittee on uh, the threats posed by the People's Republic of China to our critical infrastructure. Uh, and what was so important from my perspective was the opportunity to ensure that the American public is aware of the unacceptable risk that the PRC's PLA has placed our critical infrastructure under. I'm, uh, I've often had the concern that when it comes to cybersecurity and the threats uh, posed by cyber, that the American public, uh, since we don't see uh, the physical damage all the time, I know OT can, will, does lead to that, but I, I've been concerned about the uh, awareness of the American public to the magnitude and the significance of the threat um, and the potential damage that it caused to our day, everyday uh, way of life, uh, but that opportunity to be very explicit and it was powerful when the FBI director talked about the takedown of that uh, Chinese obfuscation network that, again, placed our critical infrastructure at unacceptable risk. Um, that was the, the first time uh, that, that, uh, that we've talked about uh, the Chinese moving from purely an espionage uh, mm -hmm. perspective, which, frankly, nations do, um, to prepositioning uh, to destroy, disrupt, America's ability to mobilize uh, in the case of uh, conflict. And to it's- To make very clear, to project power, deploy forces. Yes, indeed. And it's, it's so important not just to focus on the conflict stage. Uh, we need to be planning and prepared in the competition phase, which is where we are right now. We need to be uh, prepared in the competition phase so that uh, when it does come to a crisis, uh, if it does come to a conflict, we're ready to go uh, with cybersecurity and resilience. Awesome. And, and, and I'm going to put in a infomercial for Department of Treasury here. Project Fortress. I'm hearing we're finally starting to lean forward in some of these issues. And I think we all wanted to move in that direction, yeah. but we didn't have all the primers and all the foundational documents, basically yeah. what we would in, the, in military sense, strategy, tactics, right. te techniques, uh, procedures, all the way down to doctrinal. I think we're getting to that point. We are, and, and again, because um, we're never going to firewall our way out of this, right? I don't want to yeah. put words in. No, your mouth, no, but... you're saying things that sometimes I'm not allowed to say, and, and, <laughs> and I appreciate it. Sorry, I appreciate it. No, no, I'm grateful. Um, <laughs> but but that is one reason why uh, we will continue to emphasize resilience. We need to operate through um, some of the uh, cyber threats that will um, 
will persist. And, and being prepared is a, is a way to do that. Uh, Treasury, uh, a, a great partner. And, and one of the things I, I mentioned, the American public doesn't, uh, doesn't see America's treasure coming back harmed by cybersecurity. Um, and so that response may lag. But our, um, our, our federal departments and agencies have seen the impact of, uh, of cyber on, on carrying out their business. Uh, certainly our private sector mission partners have seen it as well. So there is momentum at that level, but we need to make sure again that every individual in America understands uh, the, the potential that we're facing on the, on the cyber front. And, and you opened up the opportunity to ask a question around OT and, yes. and operational technology, which becoming very difficult to discern IT, OT, mm -hmm. physical cyber, they're all kind of converging. Yeah. Government likes to look at the world through its boxes and org charts. Yeah. The reality is, is this is coming together. And OT does have kinetic physical impact. And yeah. when I think of the grid, when I think of ports, um, these are the sorts of things. And I saw, I was happy to see a real emphasis on that in, uh, in the implementation plan. Y yes, uh, traditionally, and I'll, I'll paint with a broad brush, so pardon me, there are exceptions. Yeah. Traditionally, when we talk cybersecurity, the focus had been on IT, which I'll, I'll call the management of electronic data. Um, but cybersecurity also um, is a significant part of OT, operational uh, technology, which again, broad brush, is uh, uh, the connection to more uh, physical mechanisms and, uh, and processes. So IT and OT, we can separate them, we can put them together. They both need to be addressed. Uh, we will see uh, more physical impact from OT, and, that, and that's where we need to focus on. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Phil uh, Venable. Mm -hmm. um, he was on a, a PCAST team. Uh, on physical cyber. Yeah, on on yeah. physical cyber that talked about the need uh, for resilience when it comes to uh, OT. Uh, but the banging the drums on don't just focus on IT. You have to focus on operational technology. Uh, that's one of the, the great things about our partnership with uh, CISA and, and their leadership of the sector risk management agencies. Uh, they are putting increased attention on OT, as does um, the implementation plan version two. Harry, the tyranny of time requires I be a tyrant, but yeah. any final thoughts, uh, questions I should have raised that I didn't, what would you like uh, our audience to leave with? Well, uh, a, a final thought, and I'm very confident that this audience is aware, but uh, uh, you know, for the rest, of, for those that may not be as aware, um, Cybersecurity uh, is, is not going to um, back off in terms of our nation's needs. Uh, this is a, a threat vector uh, that state and non-state malicious actors will continue to pursue. And to some people, it, it may be an invisible threat, but it's not. And to this audience, I know it's not an invisible threat. Uh, so in closing, I'll, I'll just tell you, I, I've uh, I recently learned um, uh, the Coast Guard uh, motto, Semper Paratus, and it's always ready. That's a ready. Navy guy. Yeah, that's a yeah, Navy guy, yeah. quoting Coast Guard. Always ready, and, and, and that's where America needs to be when it comes to cybersecurity. Always ready. There's no time off. Harry, thank you for fighting the good fight. Thank you for your public service for so many years, and thank you for always fighting for the women and men in the front line. So uh, I appreciate that. And I know I speak for everyone in this room and also uh, watching at home. Whatever we can do to help, this is a team sport. And uh, you're our quarterback, so right. bring us home, baby. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, though, no injuries. <laughs> so I'm a Jets fan, sorry. <laughs> so, um, but, but thank you, Harry. Uh, I'm going to, um, before we uh, say thank you to Harry, I want to introduce Catherine Gronberg. Catherine, are you here? I might also note we've got a great showing of senior fellows. I see Bill Evanina, Matt Hayden. I saw Mark Montgomery back there, Allie King, uh, Brian Keeter. I, I mean, we've got uh, Mike D, D'Ambrosio. So that's the, 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 the New York connection. But rather than um, uh, me introducing the panelists, I'm going to introduce Catherine Gromberg, uh, who is at uh, Night Dragon. She's done phenomenal work around cyber. 
She worked on the Hill long before cyber was cool, and uh, although she's very young, so uh, <laughs> not long before it was cool. But Catherine, the floor is yours. You are also one of our senior fellows, so thank you. And please join me in thanking Harry before we head. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I think we're gonna ask our panelists to come up just as soon as that third chair is added. Thanks for joining us. I'll start introducing the panel. I think many of you know some of these illustrious panelists. We certainly, myself, have worked with many of them for years. Um, I'm Catherine Gromberg. I'm the head of government services at Night Dragon. We're a San Francisco-based venture capital company. We do a lot of investments in cybersecurity. But I'm local, and I, as Frank said, I worked on the Hill. Um, I'm so honored to be a senior fellow at McCrary Institute. What a great group Frank has put together. The Institute does so many important things. Um, I love to stop my day and watch one of the webcasts and, and learn a thing or two that I didn't know before, including this morning, with his interview with Director Coker. Um, also, thank you to Director Coker. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for joining us at RSA at the Night Dragon Summit. It was a really busy day. We had a lot of announcements, both by your office and CISA. Um, so let me just tell you quickly, in case you don't know, um, who we have on the panel here. It's Nick Leiserson from the ONCD. He's the Assistant, Assistant National Cyber Director. And then we have um, Sherry, Sherry Pasco, who's the Director of the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. I'm trying to use spell out acronyms to start with because not everybody on the phone, on the conference line necessarily knows what NIST stands for. but. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, and finally, we have Val Cofield, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So um, this, this is a great panel. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the implementation plan, maybe a little bit 1.0 and 2.0. Um, we'll call it IP1 and IP2. That's, again, a, a, the acronym for the National Cybersecurity Implementation Plan. Um, so to me, this panel really does embody the ideal of coherence that Director Coker was talking about. Um, ONCD was envisioned not just to be a place of policy coordination, um, which I think we have a lot of in government, but the purpose of that office was to lay out a strategy for achieving national cyber resilience, to articulate the specific objectives within that strategy, and then to guide and coordinate us towards those outcomes. And when I say us, I don't mean just government, we mean the private sector too. To me, um, I have my biases, but to me the two most important ways to ensure we get to those desired outcomes is to align resources behind the specific objectives. Um, the second one is to measure our progress towards achieving those directives. And ONCD is very clearly doing both. It's doing both within two years of its being stood up, which in government is really remarkable. I think the office deserves a lot of credit. Um, uh, to put that plainly, I don't think they're messing around. <laughs> um, as Director Coker noted, IP2, it includes 31 new initiatives and six new federal agencies leading those initiatives. And some of them are being established um, kind of in real time to address needs that have even emerged since the release of IP1, which is very dynamic um, and very timely, and, but, but importantly so. We cannot obviously cover everything here today, but I would like the audience to see, as I have had the privilege of seeing working with every one of these agencies up here, that we really are now, I think, all rowing in the same direction. Um, and I, as I said, it doesn't only include the interagency, it includes us in the private sector, and we have a huge stake in this. Um, all varieties of private sector stakeholders here, um, and we also have responsibilities. Um, so I think it's just easy to see these representatives here, they have such comfort and fluency, not only in their, their taskings under the National Cyber Strategy, but also with each other's missions. I think you'll see that here, as I've seen it. Um, so let's get to it. I've already spelled out the acronyms, but raise your hand if I'm using one that you're not familiar with or any of our panelists call us out. Um, and I think what we'll do is turn first to Nick, who is really one of the people responsible for um, overseeing the development and execution of IP1 and 2. 
Um, Nick, would you kind of walk us through what you believe are the key accomplishments achieved over the last year-ish that IP1 has been released? Um, and then highlight for us like some of the new initiatives of IP2 that maybe Director Coker didn't touch on. And tell us a little bit about you know, what we got and then what we need to focus on for IP2. Great. Uh, thanks, Catherine. A nice, uh, easy, small question there. <laughs> um, so a couple of things that I would say. First, you know, thanks to uh, you and Frank and the McCrary Institute for having us. Um, it's great to be back talking about uh, spreadsheets again that have been turned into documents that can be uh, used by the private sector partners as well as the federal government to help, help understand how we're going about implementing the national cybersecurity strategy. Um, I think partnership is, is just fundamental to the way that we work in the Office of the National Cyber Director, and that's why I'm delighted to have my colleagues from the interagency here as well to talk about some of the great work they're doing, but also why it's so important to us that we keep publishing the IP. I mean, I think one of the accomplishments from IP1 is there's an IP2, <laughs> and we fully expect that we're going to keep seeing these going forward um, as a way, again, to provide some coherence to the work that's going on and also make sure everyone um, that is within the federal government, but all of our partners in industry, in state, local, tribal, territorial governments, um, even international partners can have an understanding of how we are achieving the president's vision that he laid out in the National Cybersecurity Strategy. Um, so what are some of the, the great things that, that we've done as an interagency since then? Um, there's, I'm just gonna pick five, one from each pillar. Um, but it's not, you know, picking favorites is, is very difficult when there are uh, 33 different initiatives that all completed in the last nine months. Um, so Pillar 1's focused on critical infrastructure protection. Uh, one of the things that I think is worth highlighting there is all of the work that our partners at CISA did uh, in the run-up to uh, the recently released National Security Memorandum on Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience. So one of the things that we highlighted in the IP was the need to uh, analyze through the Federal Senior Leadership Council all of the different sectors, the sector risk management agencies, and that's work that um, CISA spent an, an enormous amount of time and effort uh, doing over the last year. Um, in Pillar 2, we're focused on disruption. I just uh, was talking to some folks at the um, Department of Justice's CIO's annual cybersecurity conference. Sean Newell was on just before me. He used to be the senior advisor for the Deputy Attorney General. He's now running the uh, National Security Division at Justice's first cyber section. Um, and this is something directly tied to ensuring that at NSD, the folks who are focused on the national security mission of the Department of Justice, that uh, there is a specific section just on cyber that can look at how do we increase the speed and scale of disruption operations. Sean is running that, he's doing a great job and it's directly in alignment with initiatives in the IP to uh, increase the resourcing and the organizational structures that Justice owns and I think it's 2.1.3 but don't quote me on that. Um, okay. In pillar three we're talking about market forces and, and ways to ensure that market forces are being leveraged to improve our cybersecurity. Um, one of the things that we've seen a ton of progress on, in fact, uh, the FCC, uh, one of the 24 different agencies that lead something in the IP now, uh, the FCC in March approved their cyber trust mark um, so that you should hopefully, knock on wood, by, uh, by the holiday season start to see um, devices that have this trust mark on it that says, yes, this particular piece of technology was developed with cybersecurity in mind. Um, pillar four is focused on uh, incentivizing long-term investments and kind of affecting the uh, the fundamental cybersecurity ecosystem. There, you know, we'll take a little uh, pride in at ONCD. And one of the key accomplishments from IP1 is the release of the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy. Um, that has really animated a lot of work at ONCD from our workforce team. Um, in terms of uh, a couple of recent accomplishments that are maybe uh, steps in the right direction, maybe a bit premature to call them accomplishments, but that we've seen is uh, in skills-based hiring, both in trying to promote for uh, contracts that the federal government has, where we're bringing on skilled cyber talent that 
there is not a need for degree requirements for folks that are being brought in on requirements. And it sh in fact, not only is there not a need to do so, but it should not be something that we're seeing in contracts. We should be looking for people who are skilled regardless of what degrees they may have. And similarly, a couple of weeks ago at the White House, um, my boss, uh, right there, who, uh, helped announce with the deputy director of uh, OPM that we are bringing that same skills-based approach to um, for those uh, uh, inside the Beltway types, the 2210 series. For those outside, uh, the IT, the big, big IT uh, occupational series. And then finally, Pillar 5 focused on our work with our international partners mm -hmm. and allies. Um, just uh, two weeks ago at RSA, uh, Secretary Blinken came to RSA. That was amazing, seeing the Secretary of State coming to a cyber conference, and he announced um, our new cyberspace uh, and digital policy strategy that state has been working on. And uh, you're going to be hearing a lot about digital solidarity. And again, we're proud that this is something that is kind of tied in right there in 5.1.2 uh, as uh, something that the IP has considered. So um, I'll pause there because I'll just Straight. keep going on uh, with, you know, all, all 100 now initiatives. We can we can rattle them all off. But those are five of the things that, you know, I would say we're, we're really proud of um, at ONCD. And there's a lot more work to be done, frankly. That was great. That was a great rundown. And I think it's hard to select within those pillars what to focus on, but we had to do that. So thank you. Um, I also love the last two together, um, international and cyber education. You know, we think about that a lot at Night Dragon and think about how we ensure that our allies are cyber resilient from a workforce standpoint. Um, and then, of course, NIST, which we're going to hear from Sherry in a minute, but uh, NIST is doing a ton of great work in that area. Um, but can we come back to the critical sectors for a second? Because I'd also like to hear from Val. Um, these implementation plans have a ton of things. I wouldn't say changes, but some changes for the critical sectors. Um, and we heard the director talk about the SRMAs as a big focus and their role with the NSM. Val, could you kind of walk us through um, just some of the basics of what we need to understand? If we're in a critical sector um, without lots of policy people in Washington to understand and read these things, what are the key takeaways that we should think about for the, those critical sectors, especially the ones that are called out specifically? Yeah, no, thank you so much, and thank you um, for inviting me here to speak at this, this event. I think, um, you know, NCD Coker really did highlight some of the, the complementary work that's going on. So, you know, CISA has been involved over this year, year and a half process of finalizing the National Security Memorandum on Critical Infrastructure, and then to have the IP2 really focus in on um, you know, sector risk management agencies and the need for them to be properly resourced um, and to have cybersecurity at the forefront um, of what they do when they consider the risks that are within their sector. So the way that the US um, has uh, decided to divide uh, critical infrastructure, we are divided into 16 sectors. Um, and you know, each of these sectors has what's called a sector risk management agency um, that's the head of these sectors. And really, um, as already mentioned, under the National Defense Authorization Act of FY21, uh, there was uh, rules um, st in statute now, rules and responsibilities that each one of these sectors um, must fulfill. Um, and I think, you know, the the work that was done in the National Security Memorandum 22 on critical infrastructure was really building off of that and really helping to provide kind of more more meat on the bone of what that means and how we will go about doing that work. Um, it's it's there are a lot of aggressive timelines that are in the, the National Security Memorandum, but they're they're needed and they're important. It's been long overdue that many of these sectors have not conducted um, sector risk management assessments, and that's that is. Um, uh, that should be uh, shameful for all of us in, in government here, and, and we're really excited to kickstart and help that effort. Um, you know, there are the, the, the sectors, especially that are highlighted not only in, um, in the National Security Memorandum 22, but also in IP2, are, are really ones that are unfortunately under attack right now. Um, I actually just came from the G7 uh, Cyber Policy uh, Forum, and really, health the healthcare sector was one of the number one things that we discussed. Um, at those meetings because it is under attack not only here in the U.S. There's, number, sadly, a number of incidents that many of us um, can rattle off 
uh, that have happened and have had significant impact, physical impact, right, to our citizens. Um, and unfortunately, that's not just the case here in the U.S., but it's a case um, there's a rise in these types of attacks um, across the G7. And so, you know, it's, it's really great that at this time, um, both of these documents can come together and really focus um, on working on these risk assessments. So we're on a tight deadline of completing sector risk assessments um, within 180 days. And CISA, in its role as national coordinator, is helping to provide a framework um, of how these risk assessments need to be conducted. And we are working um, on, a, on a routinized, regular basis now. And the NSC is meeting with us regularly to make sure that we stay on top of these, these deadlines. That's great. Thanks for that update. Um, could you maybe go a step further, or maybe others um, could talk about what? So, how does that translate down into like what companies are going to have to do? We talk about harmonization, and so I think we, from from the top perspective in government, we see that as um, being necessary, so we can have an expectation that our sectors we depend on are all implementing baseline controls that I think we can agree are set by NIST um, by NIST CSF and some derivative of that. Um, but um, for them, because they're not, they're not all, maybe haven't done them equally, um, what, how, like, could you talk a little bit about, 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 about what they follow, like the CPGs, and you know, what it's going to mean for them on the ground? Um, I, well, as we're conducting these risk assessments within the sector, we all know that most of critical infrastructure here in the U.S. is owned and operated by the private sector, not by government. And so it's really important as these, each of these sectors contemplate conducting and, and um, completing their risk assessment that they include their you know, input from their sectors so that they, they, they are not doing this in a vacuum, but really understanding the challenges of the owners and operators within each of their sectors. And they're so varied, right? When you look at something like um, the water sector versus energy or treasury, um, they vary in resource, in, in cybersecurity maturity. And so I think some of the initiatives that, that we are trying to, to highlight um, and I think are discussed um, in both, or, or things that we are contemplating is also providing in innovative ways to get, provide resources to some of these sectors, especially those that are not as mature. And even if we provide them the CPGs or the NIST framework, they don't have the people, the skills, or the resources to implement them. And so it's just yet another burden that we put on these sectors. And so it's really important that we figure out how can we get the funding and the resources to these sectors. So we're trying to innovatively work with FEMA, with other agencies that have grant programs to help. Um, you know, the CISA does have their, their cybersecurity um, state grant program for SLTTs, and mm -hmm. we've been trying to highlight priorities um, within these states that they should think about um, when they think about their state cybersecurity plans. Um, but, but again, that's just a fraction of the funding and the resources really that are, that are needed to really fix the problem. Good. Thanks for highlighting that. Um, it's, it, I, I should say, like, with it, it increased funding out of the federal government for the state and local and tribal governments, um, I think it's been game changing. We see it sort of down on that end, working with the states. Um, so I would love, speaking of supporting our sectors, I'd love to turn to Sherry at the NCCOE. Um, and I'd love to give you a chance to talk about what NCCOE, NCCOE is um, within NIST, because NIST is a large agency that we know under the Department of Commerce that creates standards for us of all varieties. Um, but NCCOE has a very special mission. Um, I was so lucky to participate frequently with NCCOE projects over the years. Um, one of the most exciting ones was the Zero Trust Project, which has has become um, really important to how um, agencies are are thinking about cybersecurity. Um, but talk about NCCOE. I don't think people realize how much they are producing products that are um, specifically to aid specific sectors um, in implementing cybersecurity best practices, uh, OT, um, and all kinds of things that um, you can't just get out of the the, the core CSF. Um, and could you talk a little bit about your specific taskings relating to IP1 and 2? Because there's some really interesting things in there, I think very critical. Um, the semiconductors project that you're working on stands out in particular. If you wanted to spend a little time on that, that would be great too. Yeah, thanks for the question, Catherine. And, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation to allow me to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing at NIST under the under the strategy. So the NCCOE, um, I recently became director um, in the fall and, and have enjoyed, you know, working with the team at the center, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. We are um, a part of NIST that's really focused on transitioning standards into practice. So standards are on paper. Um, they can be difficult to implement. 
Um, um, and so we really do work in collaboration with, with industry um, to help, you know, uh, take existing standards, build out use cases that show how to use those standards. And of course, along the way, we're identifying um, improvements to products, we're identifying improvements to standards that feed back into that kind of standards development process. Um, so we've got a number of priorities um, that are very much aligned with the strategy at NCCOE. You know, we're, we're working on a really great product project um, to help organizations to migrate to the new post-quantum crypto mm -hmm. standards that NIST will be releasing this summer. And we've got more than 40 collaborators under, under CRADA from various vendors, financial institutions that are all going to be working over the next several years um, to support this transition. Um, we also have a, a great project um, focused on kind of advancing digital identity. Um, another key component of, of um, Plan 2, you know, sp focused specifically on the use case of mobile driver's licenses. So how can we best tackle the cybersecurity and privacy and usability challenges with mobile driver's licenses? So we're going to be working with Treasury and GSA and a number of state DMVs um, to really tackle that that really difficult issue um, and it, overall I mean I think it's worth saying you know NIST as a as a non-regulatory agency right we have to work with industry um, we have to understand you know what the cybersecurity challenges that industry faces that critical infrastructure faces um, so that we can then work with them and work with experts around the world to build the best technical solution um, that we hope that they will implement um, and so there's really a lot of work, you know, under collaboration and partnership with industry to really build a lot of trust um, in the standards that, that we develop. Um, and, and so specifically on, on some of the work on, on standards under the strategy, you know, we're pleased to say that we've implemented um, the initiative to, you know, re-stand re up the um, interagency working group focused on cybersecurity standards where we're going to be, um, you know, increasing communication across federal agencies um, so that we can make sure that the United States remains, you know, an active and, 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 and uh, uh, participant in kind of global standards efforts. Um, so Nick can cross that one off of his um, Excel under implementation <laughs> one. Um, we also under implementation two, you know, Catherine, you mentioned um, this really great new initiative on um, taking the NIST cybersecurity framework and tailoring it to the semiconductor manufacturing industry. So, you know, you've obviously seen um, a significant focus on, you know, domestic manufacturing and, and, and new um, billions of dollars in, in um, incentives to develop manufacturing within the United States. It's also important to make sure that we have, you know, appropriate cybersecurity practices practices and processes to protect those investments. Um, so we're going to be working with the community to really understand kind of who should help us write this profile, who's best to use it. Um, and overall, you know, the NCCOE has coordinated a number of cybersecurity framework profiles, including um, ones for you know, for space satellite systems, for ransomware, there's a great successful one for the financial sector. So this will add, you know, to that great list. And I think just stepping back a second just to speak about, you know, the NIST cybersecurity framework overall, um, NIST released, you know, CSF 2.0 in the February, another great accomplishment under kind of uh, plan number one. Um, um, we believe that the framework is a foundational and essential tool for all of critical infrastructure, all of industry to leverage to reduce their cybersecurity risks. And I think it also really helps to um, meet the um, pillar focused on kind of rebalancing accountability, the kind of an enhanced focus on cybersecurity governance um, and leadership from the top, the expansion on cybersecurity supply chain and secure software that we included in the framework, I think will drive a new level of responsibility that we haven't been able to drive before. Um, but of course, we need organizations to use it. Um, it is voluntary and we need um, the federal government um, and our partners to really support us in getting organizations to use it. And so that's why I'm so glad to be here, you know, with my colleagues um, talking about how to 
kind of make sure that standards are um, an essential part of, of the conversation. Um, I'll, I'll make one point about that is we've got a really great partnership with the State Department. Um, Nick mentioned the new kind of uh, strategy focused on international cyberspace policy. Um, the, the strategy talks quite a bit about leveraging the NIST cybersecurity framework internationally. Um, and we've, we've done a lot of great work with state to kind of talk to other foreign governments. They've picked up the cybersecurity framework for their own uses within their own regulations. Um, so that focus on um, international harmonization um, is also a really big, you know, priority for us as we move forward with our efforts under the strategy. Great, thank you so much. Um, so just I wanted to recap a little bit. So we've heard about kind of some of the new, new I would call them initiatives that have, you know, that are more under um, IP2. We heard about this your semiconductor profiles um, effort. We heard about um, the lapsus inspired juvenile justice program. Um, and then we talked about the open source. Is, is there anything we're missing that anyone would like to highlight? Because those are cool. We could talk about those. But is there anything else that, that everybody should know about if we're talking about IP2? Nick. I mean, sure. <laughs> How many do you want to hear? No. Um, so so a, a couple of others that, that I would highlight. Um, you know, we've heard already on the stage quite a bit about uh, regulatory harmonization, uh, both from the standpoint of uh, how are we thinking about applying minimum cybersecurity requirements as one tool that sectorist management agencies and regulators need to look at uh, as they look across a range of different things? Again, I think you heard the director talk about how in the FY25 budget, um, we're also looking at direct investments from, uh, for instance, EPA for the first time has $25 million dollars in their state and territorial assistant grant program um, for cybersecurity specifically. So there's, a, there's an array of tools, cyber insurance, regulation, incentives, awareness, technical assistance that all need to be brought to bear. But at the same time as we're working on that as part of implementing the strategy and NSM 22, um, there's also a focus on getting alignment, harmonization, and ideally, uh, some degree of reciprocity or mutual recognition of cybersecurity regulations as well. And that is directly building on the work of NIST, CISA that they have done um, to, you know, one of the things that, that I uh, come, to, come back to all the time is that CSF has like helped solve the alignment problem. Um, you know, we see Regulatory harmonization, it's, it's a problem that I've been dealing with for at least 15 years um, and others have been dealing with for much longer. Uh, but the alignment problem of regulators are speaking different languages is, I'm not going to say it's completely solved, but if you look at how things have changed um, since NIST released CSF 1.0 1, 1 in uh, 2013 to today, it is night and day in terms of our, of our understanding of risk. And now we're kind of trying to take the next steps to ensure that requirements are actually that are derived from a common understanding of risk are the same. And then that there's some recognition. So one of the things we talk about in IP2 um, is how can we pilot this um, in a way of saying what is, what is actually a mutual recognition or reciprocity framework that could be applied. Um, and I will say that we are, uh, you know, one of the nice things about an iterative document is that we can chunk eyes this problem some, and I won't disagree that, like, we're not taking the highest degree of difficulty first. We're saying, where is an area where we have some degree of green fields in a subsector to say it's not regulated, there are several regulators that have jurisdiction and might be interested in applying cybersecurity controls, and saying before we have five of them pile in with different frameworks, different compliance uh, requirements, different actual control requirements, can we mm -hmm. say this is the framework we're going to use? Um, and we've already conducted you know, a, a tabletop exercise last month to, to talk through exactly how would different folks come to the table and bring their authorities. Um, that is not going to solve the broader cross-sectoral problems that we see with uh, enterprise uh, cybersecurity requirements, but it is a critical first step of 
we need to know that this is achievable and to show this is what you can do when you have green fields and then try and apply some of the lessons learned to the broader challenge of, all right, but what do we do in a case where um, there are already conflicting or duplicative mm -hmm. requirements? Um, so, you know, that's one thing, for instance, that, that at, uh, at ONCD we're really excited about in, in IP2 as well. And again, I could go on forever, mm -hmm. but we'll just pause there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll, sure. I'll just add to Nick's point on the, on the regulatory harmonization, because we hear a lot about this at NIST. I mean, I think over the past 10 years, you know, since the NIST cybersecurity framework was first published, I think originally, you know, NIST heard a lot from industry, you know, you need to keep the framework voluntary. NIST is a non-regulatory mm -hmm. agency. And there's been a significant shift in recent years, really the past year, um, where now we're hearing from industry of all sectors, right, not just the financial sector, all sectors are coming to NIST. They're saying, we want you to now talk to regulators. <laughs> Can we, um, which is yeah. a huge change mm -hmm. for us. Um, so you'll see in the, in, in, in the implementation plan one and two, this uh, new direction to NIST to serve as kind of a technical advisor to regu regulators when requested mm -hmm. um, to increase kind of alignment and harmonization around the NIST cybersecurity framework as well as, um, you know, best uh, standards that, that could be leveraged within regulations. And, and so I think, you know, we've, we've begun to, to kind of partake in that effort and as I mentioned <laughs> earlier, you know, doing a lot of work as well with, with, with state on kind of international harmonization around cybersecurity standards as well. I guess I would just footnote that by saying NIST does that much with um, not a massive budget. <laughs> just always having been a proponent of NIST having the resources um, it needs to do all these new taskings. Um, so um, to bring in Val a little bit, um, in, we have a, we're going to go about eight more minutes and then we're going to take a couple questions from the audience. Um, those are, is, is, we could talk on and on about um, regulatory harmonization. I, I just would also say that out in the private sector, we of course work with companies who are often subject to multiple sets of regulations because they sell into different, they're they qualify as different sectors, and that's always interesting to watch. And then we also see the tooling coming up, like because the market's going to respond to the need to implement the tools and then to monitor the implementation. And so we're seeing sort of a, a lot of tooling that um, is more on the reporting side and also RQ, risk quantification. And so it's pretty interesting to see how when things change up here at the government level, um, there's a lot of response in the innovation world and the startup world. Um, and then the enterprises are going, well, we need those tools to answer these questions. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And it's another reason why we should all be watching McCrary Institute panels like this. The last question I would have for you is just to talk a little bit about, Director Coker mentioned um, Volt Typhoon. And it's really my opinion, uh, I don't know if you agree, that this um, was, an, it's, it's a known exploit of our critical infrastructure sort of writ large that we finally are talking about. In the past, we haven't necessarily named these. Um, we've sort of hinted at them. And this is out there, and we're talking about it. And I'm wondering how much of a role will it be, or is it intentionally um, on the part of our agencies here, all three, to talk about that as a means to um, especially talk to maybe the small and medium-sized critical infrastructure companies to start marrying up the rationale and the threat and the risk to themselves, but also sort of maybe, maybe they could have a better understanding of how together the aggregate impact of that is a real national security threat. How much of this is going is sort of the undercurrent and is driving adoption of the things that we at the federal level are pushing down? So, you know, Volt Typhoon is um, a great example of how serious um, the threat is to our critical infrastructure because um, these are new tactics, right, that are very hard to, um, to detect, um, even in sophisticated uh, enterprises, let alone when you get down to small and medium-sized businesses. Um, and so it's, it's, been, um, it's been great to see how we have tried to declassify and get out to the public more about um, how the threat is evolving and changing. Um, it's, it's not going to be an easy answer to this question because I think it comes down to some of these other things that we've talked about, um, the lack of resources in many of these sectors that are unfortunately um, prime targets for our, our nation state actors. And, and we've seen, right, that it's not just about collecting intel now, right? It is pre-positioning um, to be ready for destructive action. And so, you know, this is a change. And I think we, it's a wake-up call for all of us. Um, and, and so this is something that we are 
trying to, to work and, and continually work. So one thing that is also a part of the National Security Memorandum of 22 is, is on info sh um, intelligence and info sharing and really putting more pressure on the intelligence community to, to work on focusing in on um, threats to critical infrastructure, but then also coming up with better processes, right, of, of driving that intelligence down. I mean, I think it was a great example during um, the run-up to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia that um, unprecedented levels of intelligence. Um, I've been in this, I've been in the national security business for over 20 years, and and to see how quickly um, we were able to declass um, when there is really a will to do mm -hmm. it, to declassify mm -hmm. important intelligence, so that we made sure that the owners and operators of you know the sectors that were at risk knew about it. And so I think this is just another example of how that's going to be so important and so important, mm -hmm. especially to um, smaller. Uh, smaller businesses and more and less sophisticated sectors that are really, mm -hmm. un unfortunately, under uh, under attack and a priority for our, our nation state actors. Uh, a couple things I will add to, to Val's great answer. One is um, to toot Sissa's horn a little bit mm -hmm. so that she doesn't have to. Um, a lot of the insights that we have right about what's happening are because of the operational work of CISA. Like what we have learned is a combination of yes, uh, our great intelligence community. Um, and the ability to declassify some of that, but it's also work on the ground from CISA in terms of helping to uh, do threat hunting, do you know the the core job uh, within our domestic infrastructure to help ensure that um, when we know about uh, a, a threat from a very capable nation state actor that is also uh, doing exactly as Val said, prepositioning, that we are able to take action to help reduce that risk. Mm -hmm. um, that's point one. The other point is, you know, the fu fundamentally, foundationally in the strategy, we recognize that this is not a fair fight, right? If you are a, a water utility or even a power company or whomever it may be, um, and you're up against the PRC, that, that is not a fair fight. And the point in the strategy is we need to do a better job of shifting more of the responsibility away from those end users of technology. Um, so... Again, uh, CISA at RSA uh, released their Secure by Design pledge, right? That is foundationally part of that first shift in the strategy of saying it's not that, and it, it's very important that we're clear that always, cybersecurity will always be a responsibility. If you're in critical infrastructure, you will always have some responsibility for that, and Volt Typhoon helps make it exactly how real that is, comma, but we as the government we as capable actors in this ecosystem and technology providers need to do a better job of scoping that responsibility. Um, and that means saying, yes, there are specific things about your network, there are specific things about your operations, the data you have, et cetera, that only you know, you're closest to them, you need to make decisions to help mitigate those risks. But we really need to do a better job of ensuring that the inputs to those technologies, um, services that you're procuring, are more secure by design to reduce that degree of difficulty a great deal. And um, that is just foundational, right? I think Bull Typhoon is a great example of why the strategic approach and the strategy, as the director said, you know, we are threat agnostic, but when you look at this very specific threat and apply the principles of the strategy to it, you can see why we <laughs> why why we like uh, the the president's vision and kind of how we're approaching this problem because it's directly applicable to this very real national security challenge we face. Thanks. Those are great comments. I guess I would just add a, an, another shout out and kudos to CISA. The things I've observed is that it's become um, really in, under this administration excellent at communicating. And I mean, we have to acknowledge that it's done a great job fostering an ecosystem of PPP, which includes so many different instruments. Um, but, you know, it's probably important to call out the ISACs too, which is a really important part of that. All right, let's take a couple questions. Um, I think just one, I'm being told by the boss. So one question, who is the lucky person? It's Brian Ware in the back. <laughs> Related to that, um, something I was looking for is what is the role of SRMAs 
for identifying this uh, SIEs, um, which I think is what we're calling SIG now. Um, and so th those two are kind of part of the same thing in my head, maybe different in yours, just not, so that's my question. So um, I, I can start. Um, I think with when it comes to, uh, I'll start with SIE. So with uh, systemically important entities, uh, really we are starting that discussion with, um, we've started some of those discussions actually prior to the finalization of the National Security Memorandum 22. Um, but it's, it's really important for us to get um, input from um, each of the sectors. Um, and so we are, we are working on our development of um, our methodology of how we will define what is an, 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 an SIE um, and make sure that we get um, private sector input into um, that methodology as well as, you know, as we go down and apply that methodology um, within the sectors then to figure out, you know, what are those um, systemically important um, entities as well as looking at the cross-sector risk. So one um, challenge that or uh, one, one additional responsibility that CISA has is not only to look at each of the sectors, but as we've seen in so many attacks, you know, rarely is an incident just um, siloed into one sector. It usually has cascading impacts into different sectors. And so how do we understand those risks and looking at the cross-sector risks, which is um, um, a responsibility for CISA to be able to publish a, a cross-sector risk assessment. And I think SIEs will fall into that. And then also, you know, the important question is, so what? Like, so what if you're an SIE? What does that mean? And certainly tools like Cyber Sentry, you know, they should be first in line um, to, to receive, um, you know, tools like that to, to be able to have that advanced um, detection um, that we can really help monitor um, with those with those enterprises. But but that's still something that we haven't we haven't made final decisions on, and we're still everything's still pre-decisional. Um, but we are thinking about all those things. Nick, I don't know. You seemed like you had additional things you wanted to say. We can take one more in the back. Thanks. Um, know your customer was a big piece of the strategy, and as recently as a few weeks ago, the cloud companies were pushing back on it in comments to the Commerce Department calling it burdensome. So I'm just wondering what the current status of that is, if the administration is continuing to push hard for those rules and in cloud industry to take more responsibility. All right, so um, yeah, so from the, the standpoint, I mean, co Commerce is, is much better positioned to say exactly where we are other than um, the draft rule went out pursuant to the implementation plan 2.4.1 um, and uh, the we are still very supportive of implementing uh, executive order uh, 13894 I might have got that wrong um, that uh, that laid out exactly the the uh, the requirements for know your customer to ensure that when um, folks are leveraging, you know, so the director mentioned uh, the, the obfuscation network takedown. Um, that's important. Uh, we have seen uh, consistently adversaries leverage small and home office, small office, home office routers in particular um, to hide their activity, but they have also leveraged um, virtual service providers in, in some way, including cloud service providers. And uh, we should not be in a situation where uh, American infrastructure is being leveraged for attacks on American infra uh, uh, American IT infrastructure is being leveraged for attacks on American critical infrastructure. And so making sure that when you go back and you find out that there's a cloud provider and it's a virtual private server or something like that, that is where command and control is coming from, that there's more than just a dead end email address associated with it is an important tool for actually enabling um, disruption of uh, adversary operations. So that that continues to be a key priority in terms of implementing the strategy. I think we actually have time for one more. I'm gonna overrule you. So we have five minutes, so um, who has got a question? Go ahead. Uh, I think so, but speak loudly. Yes, and my name is Doreen McDonough. I'm with George Mason University as well as I co chair Cybersecurity Task Force uh, pioneering initiative between US and Romania. So oh. I've just been to Europe and uh, specifically also in Bucharest, leading a uh, um, US cybersecurity trade mission in the past eight years. So we heard some things here today. I'm curious about you know the international partnerships as well as 
the impact from here what we see is like inside out but from when we go out there in Europe we're also they're waiting for the US's leadership um, but I think that's a little bit of misalignment at least from what we hear in terms of inside out and outside in but the question is is there any models that you can uh, share uh, or comment on how this is work in terms of the perspective from our partners and allies in sharing you know, strategy, uh, standards, and uh, uh, implementation, policy, uh, uh, crafting, and so on. Um, just something that we noticed, and I was just curious. Uh, thank you. I think all of us you have a little bite at that apple, this. so feel free to jump in. You know, at, at NIST, we do a lot of international engagement. Um, we have one person, Amy Mon, um, who spends a, a lot of time uh, doing this um, in partnership with the State Department and, and the Department of Commerce. Um, you know, we've been very successful, I think, in kind of one-on-one -on -one engagements with, con with countries, right? So um, as well as leveraging partnerships um, in industry um, who kind of work in different countries and, and they're able to kind of advocate on our behalf as well um, given the kind of the limited resources that we have. And so if you look at, you know, across Europe, obviously all, all European countries are not using the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, but there are several that are, you know, Poland, Ireland, um, uh, uh, Italy, um, big adopter of, of the NIST cybersecurity framework under the NIS directive. Um, and so we've been really successful because we're NIST, we're able to literally get in a room with other foreign countries without, um, you know, any formal, uh, you know, paperwork, uh, any formal proceedings. And we just talk about, you know, what the cybersecurity challenges that they're facing, how they have adopted the framework, what they want us to do. Um, so because we're able to keep these conversations really informal, um, we've had a lot of success in um, um, really um, just learning um, about what our, you know, some of our allies are doing and um, how we can kind of build that back into our processes as well when we're, when we're developing standards as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the administration is very committed to our taking more of a leadership role um, on the international stage ac across a whole host of areas. So part of that is standards development. Um, both, you know, we heard Sherry talk about the interagency international uh, working group on this issue to ensure that we continue in international standards development processes as the United States to take a leadership role. Um, the administration also uh, released an international standards strategy a couple of months after the national cybersecurity strategy came out to again say, we as the U.S. need to be, we are looked at by partners across the world as wanting to take a leadership role. We need to take that seriously, and it's vital for our economic prosperity and also our national security. Um, secondly, though, on, a, on the policy front or even the regulatory front, I think there is a lot of activity that we see, particularly in the European Union. And um, we very much look at things. And I mean, I, I spend time, I know the director spends time talking to international partners um, critical infrastructure regulation comes up. And I think from our perspective, uh, it behooves us from a national security perspective and it behooves American companies when we have a good, solid, foundational United States approach to how we believe we should best mitigate cybersecurity risk and can say, this is the gold standard, this is the way that you should approach these problems, um, rather than you know, maybe being in more of a reactive posture to, to what's happening in other uh, regimes. So one thing, again, to, to highlight there in terms of trying to drive some leadership, um, Secretary Mayorkas has done a very admirable job of working with um, his partners in the EU Commission that has translated into work between CISA and ANISA on uh, incident reporting, um, something that CISA's working very hard on right now, uh, in alignment with the strategy and ensuring that um, at the least we already have a good mapping from ANISA and CISA of the various incident reporting regimes that apply in Europe and uh, the United States and hopefully driving towards more commonalities in terms of what is going to be reported, et cetera. But I think absolutely, you know, from our perspective, it's vital that the U.S. take a leadership role on cybersecurity policy um, 
again, so that we, when we have partners and allies looking, we have something to say, yes, this is, this is the approach um, that produces good outcomes, that is sensitive to industry concerns, and that does actually improve our cybersecurity posture. I guess I would just take a second to add a little bit of industry perspective um, on that because we, you know, when you're dealing with cybersecurity companies all over the world, um, some of them have very big footprints in with our international partners. Um, it's always amazing how our international partners, both in Gov and in the private sector, they're always asking about how we're doing programs in the U.S. So they want to know what our federal cybersecurity programs are. And if you're familiar, you know, you know it's like CDM for civilian and now DOD has a few um, enterprise programs and now Zero Trust. So how's DOD implementing Zero Trust? And they really want to hear from the companies who are in those programs. So we do a good bit of sort of um, explaining and, and advocacy, but they also want to know things like, well, then how does the federal government assess that? And you talk about FISMA. And it's pretty incredible to have those conversations with international partners. And then they also want to know what some of the leading industries are doing. So they might want to know, like, what are what are the top banks in the U.S. doing? And, you know, did they do something unique, which I believe they did, on third-party risk? They did that. And so our international partners are curious about that. They want to know about it. And so at the industry level, we do a good bit of explaining and advocating, too, for what goes on. Um, so I would just love to thank our panelists, um, Nick, Val, and Sherry. Thank you so much. This was great. Great program. Thanks. Thanks for all the work you do and for your service and Director Coker for joining us this morning. Well, thank you and thank Catherine for her phenomenal job moderating. Um, forgot to highlight a couple of our senior fellows that I forgot to mention. George Salmaragi is here. I saw Andrew Howell. I saw Chris Roberti, who's a soon to be announced uh, senior fellow, as well as Brian Ware. So um, I, before I let you escape, need to say, Thank you to the Office of the National Cyber Director. Uh, special thanks to Jen Berlin, Victoria Dillon, Manali Basu there. That's a phenomenal team you've got there, Harry. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my team. This is our first rodeo in our new offices. So uh, a lot to work out, but I wanted to introduce my COO, Nick Sellers, who's uh, joining us down from Auburn. Um, Don Kaufman, uh, who's uh, back there, Troy, um, Hudson, who's outside, uh, Dr. Whitman, Taylor, a bunch of different people who, who made this all possible. Most importantly, thanks to you all, uh, and uh, really appreciate it, and onward and upward. So thank you. War Eagle.